Okay. Hang on. So you just keep it low. I hey, know. what's up, doctor? What's going on? My How are you, Mark. man? My pleasure. I'm good. I'm good. Mark, you taking care of business in there? You keeping I'm the house trying, in order? Man. I'm trying my best. Okay. I'm Mark, up. I got a, I, I got a serious question. I'm going to ask you. Are you, are you in commando mode or are you wearing pants? <laughs> I'm wearing you know, shorts. He puts us to shame with his suit. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I can see everything. Let me oh, say you are in commando mode. Oh. You know, he's, he's got all these talking head jobs. He has to have a suit on at all times. He never, never knows what's going to happen. Are you wearing the whole suit? I'm wearing everything. The shoes too? No, no, not the shoes. Nor I'm not wearing the socks neither. All right, good, good, good. <laughs> wow. You want to feel it's good. You got a long day, man. I'm really sorry that uh, that, that you had. I because I Bill was telling me about how many spots you did today, and I the no, other day, it's not a it's not a big thing at all. It's just something I wanted to do. I hear you, but the other day I had uh, two back to back. I think it was uh, Sunday night, and the whole okay. thing. Uh, you know what? We'll just save it for when we start. All right, well, cool. we start. We're live. Are we are? Yeah, we're live. All right, so here we go, man. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Oh, okay. You have to do the intro all over again because you didn't know we were live. What the? What's up, everybody? So when you stood up and you didn't have any underwear on, everybody yeah, yeah, saw I was, it. I, I was ready to run out. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great, man. That's great. You know, that, you that, know, that, 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 in the you behind know, the scenes. That's 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 I worked with Gonzalez at Monroe. The people okay. come behind the scenes anyway. So, hey, listen, yeah. let, let me just, I want to introduce you, okay, to our audience before we start. Okay. So here we go. Welcome to another episode of Police Off the Cuff After Dark. My name is Mark DeMeo. I have my co-host here in all things law enforcement, Bill Cannon. What's up, Bill? I don't know. You called it after dark. It's after hours, not after, after dark. After hours, man. Yeah, that was the porn <laughs> thing. After dark was the porn thing I used to watch when I was a kid. <laughs> and our guest, and I'm, I'm honored to have him on the show. Um, he's a retired NYPD lieutenant. He Right now, he's a, he's done maybe probably 14 spot. He's a contributor to more, more uh, 14 spots just today, contributing. <laughs> he's a contributor to all the news networks. He's a um, He's a doctor. And I want to welcome him, Dr. Darren Porcher, folks. What's up, Darren? Hey, what's going on, man? I'm making house calls today, okay? So that's yeah, why we're here. Yeah, yeah. Are, are, you related, are you related to Roy DeMeo by any chance? No, actually, the DeMeo's a stage name. My last name is Sanchez. Oh, okay. <laughs> you don't it's look a like joke. a Sanchez. I do my act. It was for acting, because my first name is Mayo Banex. Well, you know, it's funny. Now that we're getting this all out there, my last name is Silverman, too. Yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm Silverman is who I really am, but I'm I didn't Dominican. know. It. I'm Dominican. My yeah, first, no. My, yeah, my last name, name's my last name's Canoni. I didn't. I was a. Oh yeah, I, I'm Hasidic. Yeah, I'm Hasidic. A lot of people didn't know, you know. No, I'm Dominican. Suntan. My first name is my your next. Oh okay. So I hated that name. So when I joined SAG, the Screen Actors Guild, I had an opportunity. So I just took my my, my baptismal name, Mark. And people used to call me Mayo, so I, I did Mark DeMayo. Oh, okay, interesting. You know, the first time I, th I heard SAG, I thought it was a sexual innuendo when somebody <laughs> said, no, it was like you. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> so um, uh, before we get started, I just want to just uh, give everybody, let, let everybody know what you do. Right now, you're uh, basically on all the news networks contributing your expertise in what's going on right now. Um, yeah, I basically speak to, you know, the topical issues attributed to policing or, or should say criminal justice. And, you know, I kind of speak to aspects that I that I can refer to from a practitioner's perspective. That doesn't necessarily mean it's right. It's primarily opinion based. However, I try to infuse as much um, quantitative and qualitative um You're using so many college words for us. Oh, OK. I okay. Can, I, can I curse on here? <laughs> Yeah, Can yeah. I curse? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let me stop with you getting up and that. <laughs> no, no. So you know, I, I speak from, you know, I, I try to give it from a fact-based perspective, so to speak. I mean, some of the stuff is opinion, but primarily what I, what I introduce is supported by facts. And, you know, I, I mean, I'm, you know, working as a professor for a number of years, but worked in the NYPD for 20 years. But now 
I kind of, I've since hung my shingle and I do expert work. So I have a, I have a homicide case on Monday, matter of fact, in Tallahassee, Florida, that I, I'm going to testify as an expert witnesses. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do it. We're doing it Zoom. It kind of sucks because I was actually supposed to fly down there. So I would have got a nice wow. little vacation had yeah. we not had the COVID-19 pandemic. So I have a, um, I got a homicide trial there. I got, I got different cases all over the place, so to speak. So that's primarily where I hang my shingle. And then with this, with the television stuff, this is kind of fun stuff. We get the chance to just like stretch out and, you know, parlay our personality. And well, you know, you could, of, you know, you could have been on our show earlier. I tried to get you earlier, but you avoided me. No, that wasn't true. I paid you. I paid you, and you said it wasn't enough. Hey, let me ask you, you know, something. I got a publicist you're, you're, to get me on here. Go ahead. You're a retired lieutenant. You did 20 years. You came on. You came on a year before me. You came on in '91. I came on in '92. You did the 20 and now, just like me. Okay. And then uh, you're a doctor right now. But how do you get involved with the TV? Because I know there's probably a lot of, you know, cops all over the country. And they're always wondering, how does somebody actually get to be that expert? I mean, I know you're a doctor, but there's also other doctors. How, do you uh, do you try to get it? Do they come to you? No, what I did was I I did in the semblance of Black Lives Matter and Al Sharpton, and they got outside of the, with the bullhorn and that one. No justice! No peace! <laughs> and then they let me in the door. And then they That's the door. <laughs> door. <laughs> You had, me for, you had me for a minute there. <laughs> no justice, no peace. Actually, he had the bullhorn. No, no, no. Today was the funeral, so he'd have the bullhorn. The bullhorn will be out tomorrow, you know, so he should be on the Brooklyn Bridge tonight. No, but, uh, you know, it, it was one of these things that it, it was organic, so to speak. I, I, I wrote a dissertation and it garnered attention from, I guess, the right people, so to speak. And Wait so a as a result the dissertation of the, that you're talking about, that's um, reducing school misdemeanor right, 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 right. settings okay. through so, school collaboration between school leaders and police. That, that was you it. Hit me in, you're outside. You're Let me ask rub, you a question. You're going to rub me out. When I, I'm you know what? If you have stretched that out anymore. Hey, well, really? Look, you know, that, really? We got a few pages. He, he needs 150 pages. You want to right. Pages. Hey, does the, uh, does the title count, count in your words? Does the yes, title count in your words? No, it's, a, it's a word count. It's not the title. It's, it's, it's not a page. It's a word count. So, you know, you got you to gotta beef this thing up and make it more robust. But, Mark, I know you read the whole dissertation, right? I, was start, I started reading it. I had to go to the library to get it, the special okay, library. What was on page 68? In the third paragraph. <laughs> Let me ask you, is that what they do <laughs> in the library somewhere? You, you, you clearly got the away from that. dissertation is in a library somewhere? No, all dissertations are stored at the University of Michigan. So if anyone writes a dissertation, that's the storage, um, that's the housing component for all dissertations. So that's what they are. But you can go online and you and can order a copy. What's the name of that place? The Board House? <laughs> the Board House. The board house. <laughs> read Does anybody ever go in there and read a dissertation? No, you know what dissertations are primarily used for research. And I'm just so, messing with you, man. Yeah. I know what you did. It's beautiful. I was going to read you. Let's go over yours now, next. Now we went no, over no, mine. Mine, mine, mine was a, a thing I did yours in was, grade. No, no, no. Yours was about opening up strip clubs in places that you didn't have a license for and how you can usurp or be surreptitious and get these strip clubs up. That's what, that's what yours was, right? I feel Coupled with joke. Coupled with that, joke, I don't, I don't, joke I don't, or coke machines. That, um, that, that I was I was knocking it anyway. It is a long time. No, no, I didn't tease you. I'm, I'm only teasing. No, I'm just saying it is a long. But yeah. I know what you did though there, and I and I understand uh, when I read the title, I kind of sort of understand where you were going with it, and uh, that was um, because right now in Minnie, I think I think it's Minneapolis right now. They actually went in and said they wanted to uh, get the cops out of the schools. Yeah, that's absolutely ridiculous. And you're referring to the defunding of police, so to speak, and that's a component yeah, but, attached yeah, to that. Yeah, that was part of it. Right. Not only are they looking to get the move the cops out of the out of the schools in Minneapolis, they're looking to defund police. In addition, Lego has come out and publicly stated that they will no longer advertise police models in connection with the Lego toys. So they were sending all advertising for police with Lego. I think they came out with a statement after that, though. This was today. There was a I restatement. Mean, there was a restatement oh, okay. by Lego afterwards. Okay. I just it, it, you know, and this is a disgrace. Keep because up with this shit. <laughs> that's why I'm here, Mark. You're taking me to the bridge, and that's why I'm here, okay? 
No, so, I just read a restatement by Lego that there was a misrepresentation into what they were trying to say. Okay. Um, so I and uh, I, I didn't re I didn't really understand their explanation, but I think they were trying to backpedal from uh, from what the perception was. Okay, because that was an atrocity to say the least. But even pulling the cops out of the schools. I'm sorry, Bill. Go ahead. You want no, to just just say uh, how in New York City? Let's just go over a little bit how how we got here. All right. And let's just like in the last 30 years, uh, crime, the index crimes have dropped 70% in New York City. Uh, you know, give a percentage here or there, which means like we always like to use the year 1990, there was 2,200 murders that year. And now I believe New York City has less than 300 murders a year. And uh, equivalent drops in, in the seven major crimes. But that took a lot of, as you were talking about, I think before, in some areas, you might say over policing, but you, as a police officer, you know that the 19th precinct on the Upper East Side isn't going to get policed the same way as the 3 2 precinct in, in Central. It's a geographical hall. strategy. It's a different, that's correct. Yeah, and you know, the 3 2 precinct back in the day had a lot of shootings, a lot of murders, and so there would be a lot of stop, question, and frisk to try to get the guns off the street. The same right. precinct might have murder a year, you know, and not a proliferation of guns or drugs. So you would police the, those areas differently. So when you speak about like over policing, there is, and it's, it's sort of targeted policing. I know, and I don't, didn't mean to give a long dissertation, but I worked six and a half years in plain clothes. And when I was an anti-crime cop, the first thing I did every day before I went out is I, re I read the 494 sheet to see where the crimes were occurring. How many robberies we had, gun calls, whatever, GLAs. And that's how we we would target specific areas. But I hear this phrase now, over policing. And I, I just, you know, I'd like to hear your comments on that. I mean, I, I, I'll be the first to tell you, you know, I've, I've perpetrated this many times. Um, and it was really contingent upon the quantitative statistics in that precinct. So let's say hypothetically, robberies were very high in a, at a particular location. So as a result of high crimes, it caused us to do more. And, you know, this is, this is prior to Floyd versus the city of New York. Um, we stopped, we frisked thousands of people. Uh, I mean, I, you know, just going back to whether I was in narcotics or in one of the plain crows units in the command. And it seemed as if it was a part of our culture to stop and frisk as many people as we could, because it was, it's one of those things that we accepted and we felt that that was the way we pulled a lot of guns off of the street. We pulled a lot of bad people out of, um, out of these places. But then when we go back to the accountability factor, Comstat came in and that's when the 250s were used as a quantitative measure to determine the productivity of the officers in that command. So it now got to a point where there was a push. 100%. And that's what, that's what ruined stop question and frisk, right. making a, a check mark on your activity report where it became not that you saw someone suspicious, you had to get X amount of stop question and frisk report each, each month. Right, and that's where the byproduct of over-policing came into play. Because if you had an officer that, that knew that, look, you know what, I need to produce some activity because if I don't produce any activity, then I'm going to hear it from possibly the commanding officer. My boss is not going to give me days off. They possibly may even switch my squad. So I want to say it was an organizational model that pushed over policing. And it was specific, it, it was more so in the communities of color. And we say that we look at, let's say the 7-5 precinct in East New York, the 3-2 precinct in Harlem, the three, four in, um, in Washington Heights. A lot of these heavy houses where there was a lot, there was a large crime content. We went in and we did, there was a practice of over-policing in these communities. And one of the things that we looked at as well, the crime is high, the CO just went to Comstat. He got his head handed to him because robberies are going through the roof and the arrests are not coming in and uh, commensurate with the number of crimes that are committed. So there was a tremendous push from the commands and it happened on, on a citywide level. It just wasn't in, I gave you three commands, but this happened all across the city. 
Bill, I'm sure that you participated in the same process the way I did and the way Mark did. And subsequently, this is where we ended up. So now we have a situation where a community is really upset. And they're saying that, hey, look, you know what? We have been over-policed more so specific to the communities of color. And now we have we have a series of demonstrations, or I should say protests, and then we have a, a, a small addendum of riotous behavior. But this riotous behavior is really overshadowing the people that are prote protesting lawfully in accordance with the First Amendment rights. So when we look at what happened to George Floyd, for example, that, that, that demonstration happened before the actual incident happened. The incident was just destroyed and broke the camel's back. And so as a result of that, we're in a, we're in a state of mayhem and the leadership at City Hall is subpar because police policy is now being did, um, driven from City Hall and not one police plaza. We have a mayor that had a daughter that was locked up as a protester. So it clearly shows where his allegiance is. And the cops uh, basically, they've been handcuffed. When we look at the first day of the, um, the, the, the first day where the curfew was put in, 11 p.m., that's absurd. You close the gate after the horses escape. Right. You see what the mass mayhem and pandemonium was on Fordham Road in the Bronx, what they did when they went to Macy's and Herald Square. This was a clear attribute. Can, can, I, can I just stop you for one second? It also yeah. seemed like that they had learned nothing about disorder control. And we had Chief Louis Anamon on our show, who basically- He was the CEO the of disorder control. Yeah, he wrote the book on that, you know? And some of the things they did when they slapped the curfew, Block the traffic. Don't let any cars come into Manhattan at a certain street. There was no mountain was nowhere to be found. How about, nowhere to be found. How about tools no like to like drones and helicopters? Absolutely. They, they, Absolutely. They, they were nowhere to be found. We have technology. They didn't use yeah, them. Yeah, but you say that, and a horse did get hit with a brick. That was in but another. That yeah, that wasn't here. That wasn't here in New York. I know. I'm just saying that you know the horse doesn't really have like a choice. Of what hey, job Mark, is. Mark, I'm going to give you what you gave me. Hey, with you're a horse. You remember when you told me to get my facts straight? Uh -huh. You're a facts for yeah, yeah, Well, I'm just saying right. a horse yeah, did a horse get hit. In New York City. I'm just saying a horse did get hit, right? Yes. And if you really think about a horse, right? They don't really, they can't really pick which job they're going to do. If you're fast, you're going to, you're going to race. Um, maybe they put you out to stud. Maybe you do some farming, or you become a police horse. <laughs> and they don't really have a choice. And now this poor horse is getting hit in the head with a brick. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's unfortunate. The first thing that came out of your mouth was the horse was the stud. What's on your mind, Mark? What <laughs> 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 I'm saying is that horse, don't hit the horse with a the brick. They didn't have a choice. They didn't take a test. Yeah, but it, just going back to that, when we look at the failures of the de Blasio administration in terms of disorder control policy, as Bill mentioned, we have the tools, the technology is stored within the NYPD, but police policy is now coming from City Hall and not one police plaza. And as you mentioned, you had Chief Animal on, and I mean, he was the architect of disorder control. And right. we still understand what, how wedge formations work, things to that effect, but it goes back to the Blasi was very specific with a hands-off policy. And out of all people, Governor Cuomo, one of the most liberal guys on the face of this earth, he even said the Palacio strategy of policing was flawed. And as a result, it was a, it, it resulted in an epic collapse. And the recipients of the inability to deliver police services, ultimately us as the eight and a half million citizens that live in New York. Right. And you know what was another thing that was, is missing from this whole response is the investigative uh, component of this whole response, because the, even the FBI and other investigative federal agencies, we, they should know who the leaders are of these Antifa groups. And, you know, what, like they say, you want to stop the horse, cut off the horse's head, you know, right. and there was no investigative component that I could see. Right. There's a whole lot of talk on horses. I mean, Mark spoke to sudden horses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? Why do you guys got such a hard horse. on for the you know horse? You say, you say that, horse Bill. Here. You know, you say that, that the uh, the FBI, um, you know, isn't keeping track. And then all of a sudden there's a guy, a Spanish guy, 
he might be in California somewhere. I'm not exactly, I forget the state, but he put a Facebook post that he was going to go out and take out cops. And um, all of a sudden, the FBI caught him with the cache of weapons in his car and stopped him from getting to his location. So that's not something that they happen to stumble upon. This is something that they've been monitoring this guy. They know that he has, uh, you know, he, he's he's uh, going off on his social media. So they were they were actually ap uh, able to apprehend him before he got to his location with this cache of weapons. And he had AR-15s in there. He was ready to go. So my point is, they are they've they they've infiltrated these groups, but obviously not enough to make you know, a difference. When you see them dropping off pallets of bricks at strategic locations, that's all. Let that. me ask that's you a question though. You know, like who's dropping them off? We could figure out who's dropping them well, off. That's what, Literally, that's in five minutes, problems. in five minutes, I can call up um, our place in the NYPD, whoever's sitting there with the rubber gun. And say, do me a favor, hold this, uh, find find the uh, who's dropping the bricks off there from Sunday to now, and I'll go and join them, and we'll sit there and watch the tape. We'll figure it out in fucking five minutes. You're yeah, absolutely right. Real time doing. crime has those camera has the capabilities with the cameras. I'm sorry, not right. to cut you off, Bill. Okay. No, I was just gonna say that's where the investigative component comes in. What was the license plate of the car that pulled up? What was the description of the people that pulled up? And that's where you got to put the investigative end of this together, also. I mean, you're absolutely. Hey, man. Dr. Yeah. Darren, how could I help you? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm running in illegal numbers then here, so just <laughs> bear with me here. This is the time. This is the cutoff. This is the cutoff time at the racetrack, so you guys got to bear with me here. So, yeah, so anyway, I can't get away from this. Let me thing, tell you right? something, bro. You're always welcome. You're on this show, man. You're a funny dude. I like you. No, no, no. It's cool. It's cool. You see, people rung the bell and they're not even coming to my house. I live in a housing project. I don't know if you guys realize that. <laughs> That's the cops trying to get in. Yeah, you yeah, got to get I'm low in, rent with that yeah, PhD money, yeah. you know? I, I'm, I'm, I'm in apartment 1C and, you know, they're doing hand hands in the hallway. So just bear with me here, okay? They just ring the wrong bell from time to time, right? He's in that office at pace. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I mean. But, you know, when we look at just the, the epic collapse of policing under the de Blasio administration, it really, it, we, we're in essence held hostage by the electorate because when we take in consideration policing, there's only a four to eight year shelf life for police policies. You're as strong as the incumbent. You have a person like Rudolph Giuliani when he was of sane mind back in the 90s, because he's a lunatic now, but back then, he, he, he was functioning with a sound mind. And so one of the things that we look at was the vision zero um, and zero tolerance policing. That was a, a, a tremendous asset to, or I should say it preempted the, the reduction or the recession of crimes that we had in New York, because as Bill mentioned, we were up to, back in 1992, I think we had um, 2,200 homicides, something like that, which right. is out, it, it was through the roof. And so that was a necessary piece, but City Hall was in a position whereas they allowed the department to function with a level of autonomy. I shouldn't say autonomy, but they, 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 they took in consideration, look, you're the subject matter experts, do what you do. And one of the things that Giuliani did do actually is when he came in, he says, look, these numbers are out, these numbers are out of control. I need you to get it in order. And at the time, I believe Animal was the chief of department, Bratton was the police commissioner. Right. And then we had some amazing strides that were made in the reduction of crime. Then we fast forward, with um, into the, the next administration, which was the Bloomberg administration. What Bloomberg did was merely, he just plagiarized the script of what was in play under the Giuliani administration. You know, no he doubt, didn't make any I adjustments. Just, I could just say, you're exactly right. And the blueprint was there. So right. the following administration just had to follow the blueprint. That was it. That but what they it. didn't do was allow for, okay, Crime is going down. Let's do a little more community policing type thing now. Because Absolutely. knock the numbers down. Now it's almost like in a war. And that's where they failed. Time policy. Let's put some peacetime policy in there. You know? Right. 
Bill, you're absolutely right. They failed. And what happened was there was a state of acrimony that existed from the community based on over-policing. Everybody was getting locked up. Everyone you spoke to had a summons. Like it, when I yeah. stopped people, it was like everyone had a warrant, you know, and they, and they were for like BS summonses, but people had warrants left and right. And then it really, I'm that's sure. what created this, this groundswell in this anti-police sentiment. And it just got worse and worse and worse. And as weird as it may sound, when people were getting locked up by the tons back then, you didn't, there was an anti-police sentiment, but it never reached the epic proportions of where it is now. Right. And, and but it continued to pro, um, progress and fester. And as Bill mentioned, we never employed the com the police community relationship, nor did we ratchet it down when we got to a certain point. We just continued to drive the statistics down as best as possible. Right, because okay. they thought they thought they could knock the numbers down to like virtually nothing. Zero. And, that, and exactly. that's when you lose the community. If you're gonna do exactly policies exactly. that are gonna drop it down because you're being too intrusive, you know. Bill, you're hundred percent accurate. And we now get to a point where once we got it to a level of uh, of sanity, now we can work on let's get together and with that cohesive police and community relationship. It didn't. You know what? And it was I'm sorry, Mark. Bring it back to your uh, your dissertation. Okay. Because what Go we're ahead. talking about right now is exactly that because we're gonna get, we're we're reaching a point right now. We're gonna start talking about do different neighborhoods get policed differently. So now we're talking about, we go back to your dissertation because it starts off at a young age too. So if you have uh, over aggressive policing and it's involved in the schools and some kids in a certain area are getting locked up for stuff that other kids in certain areas, their mothers are coming in, they're getting to talking to, you know what I'm saying? And that, that, that relationship between police officer in the school and, um, you know, when they do something bad. I would imagine that's what your dissertation's about, right? Well, I spoke to that, but what I also spoke to was a lot of times you have crimes that are committed in the neighborhood and then translate back to school ground. So you can have, let's say, like a fight that happened between two gang members or just people in that community. And they, it, it continues. It may get broken up right there, but then the continuation is the next time they see one another. And that would be on school grounds. And that's where the violence would continue to perpetuate. So we needed the, the major stakeholders to be at the table to understand and connect what happens in the external environment with the internal environment. The external meaning the precinct cops that work the area and the internal area would be the school where we have school safety officers. And it need, we need to have that information exchange. So there's a level, um, there's a lane of intelligence that allows people in the school to know that this is what's happening. But then the educators need to be on board with this too. It can't just be a police solution, whereas we're just gonna come in and lock people up. It, it's, just so, it's just so funny because when we were kids, when people had fist fights in school, nobody was going to jail, right? Right. One kid punches, one kid punches the other kid in the face. They, you know, when we were kids, it was like, okay, no big thing. Teacher broke up the fight. Then Max, they may call up your mother or your father, and that was it. Now, the, the fight happens in school. There's an arrest because yeah, this is right. This is classified as a crime. Right. What action was taken? So, you know, I'm I'm a proponent of not locking kids up, and that was one of the things that I focused on in my dissertation. Look, you know, there's certain cases where I think we need to be more discretionary as opposed to um, rising the uh, the the um I, I should say what the officers are doing well the production of officers by making arrests because arrests are a uh, key when you look at the um the, what the officers are doing the production so to speak and so we were locking these kids up left and right and then we're checking off a box yeah okay I got two collars this month in reality it was just for a BS fist fight that happened in the gymnasium yeah, but you know what it, now if you look at it you take your dissertation now with the bullying aspect of it. You know, if a child feels oh. if they're complaining about bullying and they get their parents in, the next thing you know, the cops are calling in. Somebody exactly. Open my child. Yeah. So now we're, we're exactly. we we come back. Through, you you got to do an update to that dissertation. Part well, two. no, no. With the bullying, I just think that we need, and I did discuss that too. I just think that there needs to be a level of mediation that there that 
where a void exists. We just can't lock people up for everything, um, especially now, like with this social media stuff. One kid texts the other kid, you're ugly. You can call it them for aggravated harassment. Wow. You know, it just, yeah, yeah. But that's what, what it is, right? Yeah, so I, I send you a picture that you're going to like. That's aggravated harassment. There's this is cyber bullying that's happening. It, the equation or the landscape is changing. And so I just think that we need to regress at a certain point and say, hey, look, these are kids, they're in school, and we need to have a better level of mediation as opposed to it being the criminal justice arena. Hey, let me ask you a question. How much do you think the fact that um, there is nothing else for these kids to do. I mean, obviously, there's people who are going to protest. Um, they feel they feel their 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 uh, their hearts are broken, based on the COVID nineteen. How you know schools have been closed? Is yeah, that what now, but, you know what? It's not. Uh, you know, I had posted something about it, and then I I actually took it down because, you know, as a comedian, you know, you, you, we're always thinking funny, but then you realize at some point, ah, oh, this isn't. I probably shouldn't okay. be joking around right now. But the you thing know, is, I, like, no, but the thing is, okay. it's like, um, you know, these, these, there's nothing really open and nothing for anybody else to do. So forget about the, if I go protest, why not hang out even longer and just chill and get, you know, cause this is, if you're running around there and you're watching other people do stuff like that, there's an adrenaline rush to it and there's nowhere else to go. You're going to go back home. Idle time is a devil's playground. I understand that. And this is what thinking outside of the box on the dissertation, just based on what's happened in the, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm actually amazed that we're not seeing as many um, adolescent crimes as I would have thought there would have been. A lot of the crimes that are committed, particularly with the looters, are adults. Um, for some reason or another, and this is something, that, this is a question I can't answer, the kids are not getting involved in the mischief that I expected them to get involved in. Um, because K through 12, meaning, you know, kindergarten through 12th grade, these kids have all been, there was, there's been a moratorium on schools. So these kids are all home and you have a lot of these latchkey kids that are home and, you know, their parents may have jobs where they have to show up. And so these kids are subsequently doing their own thing. I mean, there could be other things that are happening. I just, you know, now with the new generation, a lot of these kids, and just when we look at our age groups, we went outside when we were kids. Now these kids, they don't go outside anymore. They want a computer playing these games and, and, and screwing around on social media. So the dynamic of, of the pastime is drastically changed. And so I think that's really attributed to the lack of incidents that we've had with adolescents, them actually being online, playing video games, engaging with one another online, or yeah. committing to a pastime online as opposed to going outside. And we, we clearly see it with an obesity population that tends to grow and grow and grow. But then again, is it, what is obesity? I mean, technically, I mean, I'm 235 pounds or 6'1". I am classified as being obese. Mm -hmm. I mean, I work out, but By the I, I, department, I, but <laughs> across the board. I, I got, yeah, we got to open that up, man. Yeah, obesity is one of these things, man. I mean, I guess, you know, you look at the body fat um, and, you know, that may be one of those things that, you know, that come in, that come into favor with that. But still, man, it just, this has been a real interesting case. And then I think um, in the wake of the COVID pandemic, we've just had an anxious population. And you just had a lot of people that when the George Floyd case happened, it was like, look, I'm, you know, I've been pissed off for a while with what police are doing. Now this is giving me the green light to commit to mass hysteria. You know, it's going to be crazy. Imagine in two weeks, we get a spike in, in people that test positive for COVID-19. Right. And this is a result of people that were showing up to these, these protests, riots, and they weren't social distancing. Hey, That'll be some interesting. Can I ask you another question? No. <laughs> why, why do you think what were they waiting for for eight minutes and 46 seconds what eight were those freaking three cops that were on him waiting for the car was right there as far as we go new york city cops he's cuffed pick him up put him in the car if you're waiting for a victim to id him we know that's not the case now but they could id him in the car if you're waiting for a boss to come and verify the arrest they can do that when he's in the car cuffed. What were they waiting for? That I'm curious to find out what they were waiting for when this trial happens. 
I mean, that's something that'll be introduced at a later point, but this is a clear example of a systemic breakdown in that department of policy. The, super, the supervisory matrix was, was fractured to say the least. And Bill, I'm gonna kick this to you. How pissed off would you be if you were the sergeant that arrived and you saw all of these people in the street with cell phone cameras and you have this cop casually with his knee on a, on a guy's I, neck I that's be, laying on the be, ground? I would be livid. You know, I exactly. was, I was a this, sergeant. I was a sergeant for 22 years. Probably because I no, couldn't pass the lieutenant's test. But no, but Bill, this is what I'm, I'm sorry, not to cut you off, but this is how I want to bring you into this. What would be going? Would you be thinking on the lines of, "Damn, you bring me into this arena, I'm responding to this when all of these people are capturing this on video. You right. do this while I'm here. How could you even put me in a situation like that as a supervisor? Go ahead, Bill. Look, I know, just as you know from being a boss. Part of your job, a big part of your job, was to protect cops from themselves. Exactly. And, exactly. And I can't tell you how many times I pulled a cop off someone because the emotion of the minute he maybe was going to use too much force, I pulled them off. Stop. You know? Absolutely. Or someone puts their knee into someone's back and you get them cuffed. Get your knee out of his back. Restraint, asphyxia. And they may look at you as a boss, oh, these are prick. But I saved your job and I saved his life. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So, but another thing um, I want you to think about, the both of you, isn't it safe to say that the organization or the supervisory matrix sets the tone? You knew that when certain people were working, you're just not going to do certain things. I knew that, yeah. okay, if there was, when I was a cop, I knew that, okay, this boss is working. I can, I can get some overtime and no one will question it. Right, or I right. knew that I can bring certain arrests in when this boss was working. Or I knew that I can act with impunity because this boss, after they signed my memo book for the tour, I was never going to see them for the rest of the tour unless I was proactively looking for them. You know, Darren, so, I always used to love to hear the cops say, oh, so-and-so is a great guy unless you really need a boss. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, when they start saying it to the guy, when the cops we love saying, him, but when yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a good one. Exactly. There, you know? That's a good one. That's exactly. A good one. exactly. <laughs> when the cops start saying that you're a great guy, that you, you, yeah, you're then you're screwed. not doing your job. Yeah. yeah, you're screwed. And so when your I name just is written it. on the bathroom wall, you know you're a good boss. Yeah, yeah, you're a good <laughs> boss when your name is on the bathroom <laughs> wall, right? But it really goes to the tone wasn't set by the organization for something like that to happen and you put me at risk as a supervisor this right. is happening on my tour are you kidding me i would bury a guy over something like that in a heartbeat because yeah. one thing that we one thing that i in all you know going back here i've been off the job 10 years but the one thing that i prided my cops with is i want you to take care don't let me have to handle your job I want you to handle the job because if I have to handle the job, it's going to be done by the book. I would. So, I used to love the speech I would give at roll call. I would say, "Look, if you want a shit can a job, be my guest. I shit can a hundred jobs in your career, but when you call me to the scene and you want me to shit can it for you, right. no, exactly. Job is I'm not here to license numbers. you to shit can jobs. Absolutely, exactly. don't have me shit can your arrest." You do it. You have balls. You do it. Don't call yeah, me. exactly. Put my rubber stamp on it. I'm not doing it. You know. Yeah, but the, and then another thing. This cop um, had 18 c 18 complaints in 19 years, and you know he's <laughs> he, he's averaging he's averaging a complaint a year. You were you were you were uh, in CCRB and IAB, so you. I worked briefly, briefly. But, but you briefly. you've dealt with these type of complaints before. I have, and it, no, it's I know like, there's different type. And when you're in IAB, you could be investigating school safety officers. You could be investigating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Darren, it, it were, you, were you in the, uh, the the White Sox team in IAB? <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't doing White Sox. But you yeah. know, it's it, it's reverted to a White Sox operation. Everything that left that office, it seems like had a sheet of green paper, meaning a yeah. command discipline or some administrative discipline. Something's coming it. back. We're not going to waste this time. Something's got to come back. 
That right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. Well, we just... talked about policing, and and you know what? Uh, policing in you know out there, but the police department gets policed in a certain way too. And right. if there's an, if something that's an open investigation on you, even if it's completely unfounded, they gotta come back with something. So that's yeah. when the White Sox come back in. No, he like, he didn't shoot the person. No, he nobody got raped. That didn't happen at all. But you know what? Uh, he put, he forgot to put himself out for lunch. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Darren, but one you, of our uh, one of our frequent listeners, uh, his name is Bill Ryan. He just wrote something pretty uh, apropos. He wrote, "This was the perfect storm. COVID had about ten percent of the NYPD out sick." Bail reform is nobody remaining in jail. COVID had the politicians release numerous convicted criminals back onto the street. The water bucket and disrespect for uniformed police became commonplace and nothing was being done. This was a pile of kindling looking for a spark and it found one. You're yeah, absolutely right. We're operating a catch and relief stream as it relates to bail reform. And these people or the rioters are acting with impunity because they know as soon as they're taken in the cuffs, they're gonna be getting out momentarily. And there's no level of accountability on, on the part of these people. And it's just basically, it's, it's, it's creating a situation, a dangerous situation in our society that no one is willing to pick up the pieces and put back together. Well, AJ, Vance just appealed to Cuomo. He asked him to impose an emergency situation where judges would be allowed to use their discretion as to whether they released the defendant or not. He well, I remember this day. before the, before, oh, today, because I remember before COVID, they were looking to make some um, adjustments in connection with bail reform. And I, I knew it had to happen because no one was happy with bail reform. The only people that were happy were the criminals. When you ask the people that lived in these communities, they were, in particular, the communities of color, they're under siege. They don't want these people in their communities creating all types of mass hysteria. And so imagine if a person commits to a criminal act, you call the police, the police remove them, they bring them to the command, they fingerprint them, meaning live scan them, and then the person's back home in two hours. How do you feel as a victim when you see, this, when you see the offender come back to the same location where they were arrested in Great. two hours? But it's also disingenuous in calling certain crimes nonviolent. Robbery third degree, robbery second aided by another. Those are violent crimes. They're calling them not violent. That list. Burglary not violent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, 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 the burglary and such, like that list was just outrageous. When you know the, the number of commercial burglaries in the wake of the COVID 19 has reached epic proportions because these people know that there's no one in these stores. And they're, they're busting into these stores and they're burglarizing these, the, these properties. Coupled with what's going on now with the mass looting, we saw what just happened in Macy's and Herald Square. I mean, it was a free for all with, with, with people going in there to loot and pillage that business. And the, what, right. what no one is identifying is the small business is the key component to the socioeconomic empowerment on, on us opening. The people that live in these communities of color are going to work in these small businesses. We need those jobs more than anyone else. And then when you have looters that are coming into the city from places like the Catskills, where we had the two females that drove down from the Catskills and threw a Molotov cocktail into the police car, these people come in from outside, they're destroying the city that we live in and they're going back into the suburbs. I mean, do we have people doing it here? Yes, we do, but it's well, a the, small the, faction. The lawyers from Brooklyn also. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and can you, just, uh, let me ask you a question because you went through the whole, th you, you studied, you busted your ass. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, you, how much work goes into getting a freaking doctorate? I can't even imagine, but you know, here you got another guy, same complexion, goes through law school, goes through college, goes through law school, becomes a lawyer, and gets emotionally attached to a situation where he puts his whole future on the line. I mean, what? How? Where is the rationale there? I mean, you what know, the fuck was this he, guy thinking? He's probably going to get the ethics committee is probably going to disbar him. 
you know, you put it all on the line for it. And this is just a classic example of people that just don't think, you know, acting on emotion, emotion. acting on e opportunity and emotion. And we're seeing a lot, lot of that. Place, a lot of this comes from people who don't know what the fuck they want to do. Yeah. When you get, when you have a thing you want to do and you, you, you're focused on reaching a certain destination, that's the one thing this country affords you is the opportunity. You pick that freaking thing and you go for it. Everything else is a distraction. That's what I tell my kids. I said, don't get too emotionally involved in shit that ain't gonna help you get to wherever it is the where you wanna get. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Give it a nod. Albert Einstein said, man, smart people ignore. They ignore. Just stay focused on your shit. And you got a whole bunch of people out there that ain't focused on nothing. You know what I'm saying? And this guy who wasted all those freaking years in school and the girl that was with him, also another lawyer. I mean, what the fuck were you thinking, man? If, I'm telling you right now, wherever they are, they're fucking crying right now, crying. And saying, why me? And then they're probably gonna blame the system. They're probably gonna say the system was against me I saw and a I'm girl. a recipient of a miscarriage of justice. I saw a girl. Well, a couple of girls, yeah. but they were trying to light this thing on fire. It was uh, it was like a piece of wood, whatever, and they wanted to light it on fire. Their, their goal is, I guess, to start like a bonfire wherever they're protesting. And they're running back and forth. Now, this whole thing is caught on camera. You know as well as I do, law enforcement, that thing comes back to hurt somebody in the future because it turns into a bigger fire than people can control. Those girls that were there just putting, you know, pushing whatever it was that needed to get in there to get lit more, they're going to get charged with arson. They're on camera. And they're going to be sitting there, you know, as well as I do. You know what I'm saying? Think about what you're doing. Yeah, and a lot of these people are not thinking. But let me ask you guys a question. How do you think the president is handling this? I don't think he's been a good communicator. I don't think he's been a good leader. Uh, I could see at times, uh, I think well, but that goes right down into our state. I don't think Cuomo has been a very good leader with this either. And we all know de Blasio has been a, yeah. a horrendous leader. I give I give de Blasio credit. He's been consistent the whole way through. Yeah, he's been horrible the whole yeah, way through. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. No, I don't think Trump's been a good leader with this either. I don't. Okay. How yeah. about you, Mark? What's your take on Bill? I got to agree with Bill. I mean, like, if I listen, I'm a no, I'm a nobody. I'm an idiot. Okay. <laughs> you know I'm saying, but if I could think of a hundred different ways to say something better, I could. And in these times, a lot of it is just saying something better. Right. Yeah, you know what right. I'm saying? <clears throat> just figure out a way to say it good. So everybody gets it. You know what I'm saying? Whatever it is that you got to say. You know, I'm yeah. sorry, go ahead, Bill. What well, was that? Diffusing a situation through good leadership, through saying yeah, like you're you absolutely say, right. Saying the right thing. I just want to say one second. Dan Bibb here, ADA Dan Bibb, James Shanahan. He you know what it is? He thinks you're still on his platform, Darren. He wants to be on the show. He had his show the other night. Yeah, I saw him on there. I tell James I may need a hostage negotiator one day because if my old lady tries to smoke me, he's going to be the guy that I call on sweet about. He's killing me in the back. I need you to come. But you know, then the problem, with, force, the problem with Jimmy coming up, he may just tell her to smoke me. That way he can end it and, and go home. So it could be a, a catch 22. You know how in demand he's going to be with that de-escalation training he does? Well, Him he used to do the, the verbal video. judo years ago. Years hey, ago, Jimmy used to do the verbal judo. Yeah. You know what? Since we still have you, man, and before it gets too far along, I want to ask you a couple of questions because you were part of creating the lieutenant's test, right? I did that. Okay, so when you were creating the new lieutenant's test, did you keep in mind minority candidates? Absolutely. I gave Absolutely. all of the blacks the answers. No, 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 no. I'm just <laughs> yeah, yeah. The reason why I mentioned that. <laughs> the reason why I mentioned that. I created the quota system. No, no. The reason why I mentioned that is the you. FDNY test that I took. Um, that I got, I, I got a hundred on the physical, and I got like a ninety-six point two on the written. You need a hundred on that. Plus the five point residency uh, thing for being a city resident. 
And somehow I still wound up with a 92.6. And I always question that. And it turns out that they won a lawsuit. The minorities, the Hispanics and the blacks, they won a lawsuit with that FDNY test that I took that was way back in like 94. And I know that was a big thing uh, as far as promotional tests, citywide tests. Um, and I was wondering like, you know, is, the, is there a, can you create a bias in a promotional test? Well, I'll tell you this. It, it was kind of weird. What we did was we worked on content. And well, I should say the part of the exam that I was involved with was the construction of content. Now, in terms of targeting a certain group or that never came into play. It was just, look, this is what the patrol guide is. This, these, these are the um, legal bulletins, um, operations order, do your thing. That's the way this came into play. We focused on the job of a lieutenant, whereas the decisions that a lieutenant would make where they wouldn't have necessarily the ability to look back into a patrol guy, something that you should know right on the spot, as opposed to coming back to the command and researching the guy. There was never, I mean, never an instance where someone brought to my attention, look, we want to focus on this group. We want this group to do well. We don't want that group to do well. It was nothing like that. It was strictly well, the. But you it, must it, have designed the test for me to fail it twice because I did. <laughs> <laughs> now your problem, Bill, is I, you knew how much I was charging. I wanted ten <laughs> grand a head. Oh, I could have hit you off. Eight. 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 You eight. 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 me that? What are you kidding me? You know. Plus. I wanted plane tickets to Europe, so and that, that's what we. You know we something? Were. Sometimes things happen for a reason. I got to be a sergeant in homicide. I got the money. I made lieutenant. Which you you were it, when Bronx homicide? No, Manhattan North. Okay. Yeah, okay. so I got to do that for almost ten. The murder years. police. Yeah, so it was you know okay. things happen for a reason, as they say. You know, I look right, right. cool. I was yeah. I say they say where'd you work? I. I was a sergeant in Manhattan North Homicide instead of being a desk officer, you know, in the borough, <laughs> you know. Hey, my, um, my. Doctor, before uh, I want to ask you something, you had the opportunity in your 20 years to work, you worked in housing, right? I worked in housing. And then you also worked in- I training. lived there. I, I mean, I live in I live in housing right now. You in one C. <laughs> <laughs> Doing hand to hands in the hallway. Yeah, yeah, hold on one second. Not you now, also, it's too <laughs> early. But you worked in uh, training. He's in the record room. Yeah. yeah. What so, you in know, training you know, too? You know, we don't answer jobs in housing. What are you but kidding just, me? Were you in transit too, right? I was in transit. I was in District 3 in Washington Heights in Harlem. Okay, but but you also did some stuff for the city. So you worked in all three branches of our job, housing, transit, in your 20 years, and city. Didn't you? you were, yeah, you were my hookup, though. You were my hookup. You know what I'm just saying, that's, that's when people get to do that. Okay. So which one was the best? Well, housing was, was great because I, I was moving kilos of heroin in, at a 1C, <laughs> right? So that was good because I had, I had a location to store the product. In yeah. transit, it was cool because the fare, let's say it was hypothetically maybe two, two bucks or something like that. I would charge people a buck 50 and then, you know, that's when grab comes into play, so. No, and you know, it's hard to say, man, because there were different things, you know, there were different things, um, so. Darren, where are, you, where are you getting your suits? Where do I get my suits? Whoever's on the arm. Yeah, OTA. Yeah, yeah. 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 whoever's on the arm. Yeah. Where do I OTA, man. man. <laughs> we have a detective on the arm. Really? You don't go to Carlo? You don't go to Carlo in Times Square? No, some people are on the arm willingly. Some people are on the arm reluctantly. Yeah. But either way, you know, no, it depends. Because I'll tell them what suits I wear when I be a talking head on CNN, right? No, I'm going to tell you the secret to getting a really good suit at a really cheap rate. Get a suit that's maybe a year old, a season or two out. Because suits don't really change much unless you're one of these fashionably, lo fashionably loyal guys. You go with a, a, a traditional suit and it, they basically look the same. The difference is like maybe you're, the inside may be a different color or there may be a different color for a button, but we don't care about that stuff. You know, if you just want to get a, a straight navy blue suit, you can probably get a navy blue suit for maybe two and change, 200 bucks. 
And it'll be something that'll, it, it would be an older suit, but at the same token, it's going to really do what you need it you to said do. Get a spend suit more money on your ties than I used to spend on my suits. Well, I mean, you know, as you evolve, right, you know, what's, what kind of ties? Wait a minute, wait, I mean, wait. Did you just say get a get your suit at Old Navy? <laughs> Have I gotten a suit from Old Navy? No, I've never gone to Old Navy before. Not that I wouldn't ever. I'll buy a suit from the Frank card if they're selling Target, it. Target, though. I'll, yeah. get a, I'll get a suit from Target in a minute. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but no, you know, it just really depends. I never buy anything at retail, never, never, because you know, it just like, especially a lot of the stuff that I do, you wear so much of this stuff. Um, I really try to avoid paying retail at all costs. Isn't that an interesting thing, keeping track of what you wore on what show when you did it? You know what I'm saying? It's like, because when you look at your stuff, you're like, you got to remember, okay, did I do it on this? Because you got to distance your times on TV between the time you wore that. You don't want to be wearing the same exact thing when you just wore it like two weeks ago on somebody else's show. I changed the suits, not the underwear. <laughs> <laughs> I got two pairs that keep me through the whole week. Darren, what do you, what do you tell tack your Tack in, tack in and tack out. <laughs> Darren, do you tell your students, uh, if one of your students now asked you, what do you think about me going on in the New York City Police Department? Oh, my God. Say to them. Well, you know, and, and you're going to be surprised to hear me say something like this. You know, um, there are a lot of bad things attributed to being a member of the department, but I would, if I had the chance to do it all over again, I would do it all over again. Me I too. think the reason why we look at it in, from a negative perspective is we saw what the progression was. We saw what it was when we got there, and it was very different than how it was when we made our exit. But right. if I had the chance to do it all over again, I wouldn't change a thing. I, think I, made, that. I, loved, I loved the job and I, you know, yeah. I cherish and I, uh, I did almost 27 years and, uh, you know, I have great memories. I met great people and I would always talk positive about it. But I, when I see what's happening now, I wouldn't uh, recommend my kids go on a police department. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying about that. It's like yeah. your kid playing football. You don't want it to it's, really play football. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, I teach criminal justice and Bill, you teach criminal justice, too. And a large majority of your students want to become cops. Um, I, I I tell them I, I don't guide them. I just say, hey, look, you know, they because they come in the door telling me they want to become a cop. Right. I don't discourage them. I I just give them. I impart my knowledge of what would happen based on my career, the twenty year tenure. Um, I don't think I've ever said no. Don't become a cop. You know, there are some positive, there's some negatives. But the one thing that I will say about being a cop is. If you're a nosy person, this is the best line of work to be in because you can pay to ask questions. You know? What about this? Too. What about that? Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you know what? We started the... Go ahead. No, go ahead. And then you as a cop have the ability to get into situations that the average person can't, such as whether it's entering a crime scene, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. disasters that happen. I mean, I was a sergeant during 9-11. I was down in the World Trade Center, but I mean, granted, I was working. But you get the chance to work behind the scenes and see the inner workings or, you know, the battles of what's going on. Right. Working these presidential details. I mean, I've been in the Waldorf um, 20, uh, three yards away from the president, you know, so. But anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Bill. No, no, I mean, uh, you know what I want to ask you, too? Are you strapped? Every day. Well, I'm in the house, so you know. I mean, I got. You're you asked me strapped. Still strapped as a black. You asked me, am I strapped as a black man? No, no, no. I'm asking you say, you the answer is yes. You're still strapped. You asked me, am I strapped as a black man? The answer is yes. Oh, that, well, yeah. well, when you, you strapped the, 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 ex, the external, the external. <laughs> I you know what's funny? We we started the show off with uh, not knowing that we were live, and in that pre, in that conversation that we had cut short. We were uh, we brought up that they're getting six resignations a day. The NYPD. So uh, I, why not just bring that up and because I cut it off because I was like, let's save it for the show, and I don't want to forget about it. So is that a fact? Are, they, are people resigning right now? This is a sentiment that I'm hearing from guys that I know that are on the job. But you know how it is. Like I I don't have a teletype in front of me, and you guys all know that the um. Concrete proof is what you see on the teletype. Right. This is just what I'm hearing from guys on a job. Yeah, roughly six, six guys are resigning a day. 
Now, if I was in the command, I would look at the teletype myself. I say teletype, I don't even think they use teletypes anymore. I think everything is just on a computer screen and that's where you see the orders. And um, that's where this is coming from. But I just, I, I don't have a qualitative tool that I can make that assessment with. How about you? Did you hear something? No, no, I just, when we started the show off, uh, okay. I think Bill had said it, somebody mentioned it and I thought it was interesting. That was me, yeah. And, um, you know, I wanted to know if that was true because, you know, are we, are we, is it retirement? I know a lot of people probably retiring right now that are eligible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's true. yeah. Yeah, I think it's about time to wrap it I up. I mean, I, yeah, 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 for real. If you if you're doing you. twenty in a day, you're not doing that extra day. You just say, I did know. twenty. I did twenty and it got too. out. You know, because I had something going on. I was actually me too working on the. What were you? What were you managing a brothel? That's <laughs> why so you had to leave. <laughs> they were gonna force you out. Uh, oh, you had two two brothels. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, no, Too I was much work. That's it. I was just doing comedy, but I knew I could make enough money that I didn't have wow. to, uh, you know, I could get my pension and, and make money doing comedy. So, comedy is a great thing. You, the problem that I could see that you run into is everyone is so hypersensitive, and like I would tell a joke about anything, but now nah, you got to be really careful about the lanes yeah. that you jump well, in. Now, whether yeah, you're now, speaking I'm to talking about now, but when I first started, yeah. it wasn't like that at all. You know, I've been doing this for twenty years, over twenty okay. years. So race, you I've know, been, race, you know, uh, you, know you can talk about sexuality. Started. And then you're talking about a current event right now where uh, you could go to, you could go to Brooklyn North over there and do a spot by the Barclays and uh, at that comedy club that my friends own, my friend owns Marco and uh, which is called the Eastville comedy club. And uh, that's, that's going to be a crowd that you, you might not, you might not be able to get away with the uh, stuff. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Yeah, because yeah. everything is like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah. you know what I'm it's saying? Tight. There's a lot of touchy subjects and they, and they they jump off at a word. They're not even waiting for the whole joke to turn around to be to, to, to get the joke. I'm not right. saying this club out. I'm just saying that type no, of but I understand that are very, I understand. they're on, uh, they're triggered, very easily triggered. Triggered, yeah, that's a right. good word, triggered. I, you know, I, I just want to say this in terms of comedy. I watched Eddie Murphy Raw the other day. Uh, you know what would happen? He did that today. <laughs> people sat back. And watched, oh, people sat back and watched Eddie Murphy Raw. I and, sat down with a girl and I said, "I'm going to show you the funniest man in the world ever." And I put on. I forget which. It, it might have been the Raw one. You're like you're right. And the first joke is him walking back and forth on stage. I don't yeah. want any faggots looking at my ass. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he just, you know, he, he I mean, just like, and right crazy. off the bat, I went, my, my shoulders went like this. And like, I could oh, feel the tension on her man. side. Like, yeah, and then I, I can... <laughs> the funniest yeah, it, part it, it, is the next album starts off with, I still don't want no faggots looking at my ass. Yeah, so it's it like, you know, like, man, it's just it's crazy. <laughs> but, you know, um, Joe Piscopo <laughs> is a friend of mine. Who? And Joe Piscopo. Oh yeah, yeah. Is a friend of mine. So they were on Saturday Night Live together, and you know, even he tells me like what it was like being a comedian in that era on Saturday Night Live because you figure he was on with John Belushi yeah. and like the heavy hitters. But in any event, I gotta get ready to wrap up because I have another thing that I have to do. I but you. guys, I get all my questions out of the way. Oh, you're funny. I, Adam, I, like, can I, I, let me before you leave. Let me just ask you one thing. Okay. Where do we go from here with these demonstrations and with these? Uh, it's, is it starting to get calmer out there? Uh, are we policing it better now? Is it? Is, well, is it going to be? Depressing? What I think. You know. I'm sorry. Okay, no, I'm cutting you off. I no, I'm just saying. Uh, where do we go from here with these demonstrations? Well, right now there should be a back channel consistent consisting of community leaders, law enforcement executives, and pol and politicians that should be having a back, a back channel negotiation as to how can they diffuse this? Because each, each, parts, each of those three entities have a lane that they can address and they can attach to. And that will garner in a level of a sense of calm. And that's usually how this thing happens. The community leaders will be able to quell the, the violence just based on speaking to the people in the crowd. So 
We need to reject the agitators. We need to regress. We want to go to business as usual. The police are going to come forth with a strategy that aligns with what the community leader has recommended. Look, you know what? These people are going to go back home. Um, we can continue to move forward with the moratorium or in either shutting down at 8 p.m. or wherever the case may be. And the, po and, and the politicians, they have to be a part of the solution because ultimately our salaries are being paid, or I should say the police salary is being paid through tax revenue. And they do have the ability to drive legislation. I'm not saying that this is going to get to the point of legislation, but I think they're just going to introduce a series of benchmarks that they want to introduce over the course of time. And it'll be a whole lot of yes, yes, yes. So I just don't see this going further than in the next couple of days. And it, it's just one of these things that's unfortunate um, that's even gotten to this point. I didn't think it would have gone this long, but I think the, tri the triangulation of those three assets in the back channel negotiations is gonna be the crux to receding the demonstrations that have been plaguing the city and the nation as a result. Hey, Darren, I wanna thank you. Dr. Darren Porcher, I wanna thank you for sitting with us tonight. Uh, Thanks for having great, me, by Mark. the way. And um, where's and the Bill, place thank where? you. Darren, you're a pretty you good leave. Darren, you're a pretty nice fucking guy, man. I'm a great guy. Hey, listen, <laughs> where, where is this place that they keep the dissertations? The massage parlor right off of Third Avenue. Oh, come on, really? Come on, oh, on, 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 really? Come on, tell me. This is a Turkish massage. No, no, it's um, Michigan State University. Okay, That's so listen to our fans. Story. If you're ever in Michigan State <laughs> University no, no, you can and you want to it. read Dr. Darren Porcher's dissertation, it's called Reducing School Misdemeanor Assaults in Urban Settings Through School Collaboration Between School Leaders and police. Mark, you're an amazing reader. Thank you so much. <laughs> that's, Gents, that's a mouthful. Yeah. You were a great Be guest, well. man. And I, no, I got to tell you. you, you got a phenomenal sense of humor. We'll, we'd love to have you back, man. Anytime you want to come on, we, we got you. All right. Well, we're going to have that measuring contest offset, right? I think that'll determine who does what. <laughs> Guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Were great. Take it easy, man. You were right? great, man. Darren, thank no, you so much. Man. Thank you. We're great. Right. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Enjoy your night, guys. Thank you, you too, man. Cool. Thank you. For, thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. Hope let's do it again. Yeah, Absolutely. definitely. Definitely. Right, cool. studio.